welcome everybody to this CARP Nova Scotia presentation by Laura Lundquist, uh, Laura of Zoomer Physiotherapy and Health Solutions, and our presentation tonight, one that is certainly near and dear to my heart, uh, I'm Bill Van Gorder, by the way, walking well and what it means, why it matters and how to, to do it, a topic that uh, I know you must be interested in because you're here tonight, so uh, I'm not going to take uh, up any more time except to introduce Laura and ask her to uh, go on with the uh, presentation. A couple more people coming in here, Laura. I'll just remind folks that they should have their computer set to presenter mode, and it, you'll see the uh, you'll see Laura and you'll see the uh, PowerPoint most easily that way. If you're using uh, a regular computer, you'll find the little uh icon for that up in the right hand corner of your screen just put your cursor up there you'll see a square with three dots above it click on it and you'll be able to choose the kind of view you want if you're using an apple product that same information is down at the bottom on the left hand uh, side so enough from uh, me laura uh turn it over to you awesome Thanks, Bill. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. So thank you to Carp Nova Scotia for inviting me to come and be a uh, part or with you this evening to talk about walking well. I think is, it is something that's really important to talk about. Uh, and what's important are these three things that I have said here, which is what exactly do I mean when I say walking well, why that should matter to you, and then most importantly, how to do it. So that's, uh, those are our goals for, for today as we make our way through this. Just a little bit of background about me before we get too far into it. I am a registered physiotherapist and I'm the owner here at Zoomers uh, in Halifax. I've been practicing since 2003 and I hold the highest credentials in orthopedic and sport physical therapy uh, in Canada. So I had worked quite a bit in elite athletics and earlier in my career. And what I found though, was that in my clinical practice, for older adults that were trying to maintain active, healthy living, there just weren't a lot of resources in the community in terms of supporting their health and fitness goals. And so I took the plunge in 2018 and opened Zoomers here. And we've just been thrilled to be supporting, like I say, the health and fitness of, um, of older adults ever since. And uh, this is just a picture of me here, my husband and my two children, Oscar and Hazel, as we're walking, perhaps don't evaluate the quality of our walking in our flip flops and our uh, summer saunter, but, um, but we were walking nonetheless. <laughs> Uh, as we get to the end today, here are the things that I hope you take away. I will not be awarding any medals or certificates as Hazel got here for her soccer participation this summer. Uh, but I do hope that you understand with I'm sorry, you walk away with a better understanding of the power of a walking program and what it can really do for you. I hope that I pique your curiosity a little bit about your own walking quality and you start to really think about it and evaluate whether or not you are where you think you are and, and where you want to be, and that you feel empowered to seek the help that you need in order to get the right tools, get the right exercises to support whatever your specific needs are in improving the quality of your walking. Uh, and then lastly, I really hope that you feel confident to get started uh, on a walking program or that you feel like you've got some tools uh, and ideas that you can use to progress a walking program if you're already um, doing one or following one. In order to do that, here's our agenda. We're going to talk about the health benefits of walking, uh, many of which will probably be familiar to you, but we'll go through them just as a review. I'm going to define what I, what I mean when I say walking well, and then we'll talk about strategies that can optimize your walking quality. So whether that's different exercises or tools and um, how to get started, like I say, and progress a, uh, a walking program. So let's talk about why walking is so great. Hippocrates said back in 400 BC, walking is man's best medicine. Definitely back then, uh, as a Greek physician, he did not have, or people did not have access to the same uh, number of different opportunities for exercise as we have uh, in the 21st century. But even then they recognized that walking was really, really powerful in terms of maintaining the health of humans. And so the same is true today. The benefits of walking as compared to some other exercises are that it is really accessible. So for the most part, you can walk out your door and go for a walk and get a healthy walk that's going to benefit your overall health. It also is relatively inexpensive. 
So as compared to needing uh, you know, expensive equipment or access to specific facilities, it really, you need a good pair of footwear. And we're gonna talk about footwear a little bit later, but that's really the only piece of equipment that's necessary to ensure that you uh, can participate safely in a walking program. Other benefits, and these would be ones that certainly would be familiar to you, I hope, is that engaging in regular cardiovascular exercise, which would be our exercise that challenges both your heart and your lungs, helps to manage the risk of developing and the severity of, of a number of different health conditions. So conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, a number of different cancers, it can reduce your risk of falls. It also can be really helpful for mental health and mood stabilization. As well, we know that walking programs and cardiovascular exercise are helpful for warding off dementia and cognitive decline. And so you may be wondering why I have the hand sanitizer here as a picture, but you know we've all been using probably more hand sanitizer or at least better hand hygiene in the last 18 months. And that is helping us to uh, prevent the spread of COVID, but also helping to prevent the spread of a number of other diseases and conditions. And so walking, just like it is healthy for your heart and lungs, you can see that it has lots of different fallout in terms of preventing disease and decline in other systems. And so it really is a powerful tool that is inexpensive and accessible for most of us. Uh, and so it's a great way that we can be empowered to improve our own health. And then the question is, but how much is enough? Like, do you need to walk an hour a day to get those benefits? What's the, what's the general rule of thumb? Well, the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines tell us that up to two and a half hours a, or two and a half hours a week would be the recommended volume of cardiovascular or aerobic exercise. And so uh, that wouldn't necessarily have to be walking, but if we were talking specifically about a walking program, that would mean doing 150 minutes over the course of seven days. And that can be divided into bouts as short as 10 minutes. So if you go for a 10 minute walk, you can count that towards your 150 minutes uh, each week. It's also beneficial to add strengthening and balance exercises and mobility exercises. And the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines would recommend that that would be two to three times a week. And then the last line there, which is really important, is that these are not meant as maximums. So we know that more physical activity provides greater health benefits. So these should really be the minimums that we're all striving to hit. And then perhaps if you get beyond that, that's even better. However, that was the quantity piece, but it's not just about quantity, the quality of the walking matters. And I'm gonna show you what I mean here. So Hazel, who you saw with the medal, if uh, technology agrees with me here, I'll be able to show you. This is on the left-hand side of the screen, whoops. It's, you'll hear me very excited. She's about 13 months and taking some of her first steps here in this video. Whoops, hold on here, sorry. Oh, technology. Pull towards me, go. <laughs> sorry, I practiced this so many times. There she goes. And there's the ever supportive brother providing the dinky toys as, <laughs> as motivation. So that's Hazel at 13 months. Here comes Hazel at four and a half years. And then run. <laughs> so as you can see, there's quite a progression that just happens naturally as we mature, right? So from age 13 months to age four and a half, you can see that she went from having her legs very far apart, her arms were out, she was taking small steps, she looked very um, unsteady and she looked very uncertain as to her ability to make it across the room. And, uh, and then in exhibit B here at four and a half years, you can see that, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but in her hand, she was holding a leaf. She certainly didn't need her hands out to the side. She was very intent on holding that leaf. And and, uh, and then she walked with her legs right underneath her and was able to progress quite quickly into a really confident run. He didn't have any concern that she might topple over at any moment. Uh, whereas in the first video, I certainly had that concern. So the key is we, it's not linear. It's not always a one-way street. We don't just go from exhibit A here to exhibit B and then stay in the exhibit B state forever. So it's important that we identify where we are on that continuum and then make sure that we're doing everything possible to be in our best quality possible. 
And so when we talk about that quality or walking well, we want to talk about, uh, I like to call it the public service announcement or the PSA of walking. So P stands for pattern. So we want to think about the step pattern that we're using. Ideally, in most circumstances with walking, we want to see that you get a soft heel strike as your foot steps forward, your heel hits the ground first. And then as your weight is accepted onto the foot and you go to move forward, then you push off your toes in order to use all of the muscles in your lower body and core to propel yourself forward. So the P stands for pattern. The S stands for speed. So speed matters here. We wanna make sure that we have adequate strength and power in our muscles in order to move us as we're walking at a relatively, um, at, a, you know, at a moderate speed. So we don't wanna be going as slow as Hazel was in, uh, in the first example there. We don't necessarily need to be running, but we do want to be moving with, uh, with an adequate speed. And then the A stands for agility. And this means that you need to have uh, adequate reactivity and balance in order to move confidently. So again, if you think of uh, Hazel at 13 months, you could tell that she didn't feel like she had good reactivity. She didn't feel like she had good balance. If my son had sneezed at her, she probably would have fallen over. But, uh, but then as her walking quality improved over the subsequent three years, now she looked very sure and confident on her feet and was able to progress from standing to running or to walking to running while holding a leaf without dropping it um, and doing that all very confidently. So when we talk about walking well, we're talking about the pattern, the speed and the agility with which we're moving. So then the next question should be, well, how do you measure up? So are you walking well? Now, not to be left out, here's my son, Oscar, obviously getting measured for something other than walking uh, quality, but, uh, but being measured nonetheless. So what's important here is that in the course of our session together tonight, it's really not possible for you to be able to assess your quality of walking but you're gonna have access to, this, to a recording of this presentation uh, in a few days. And when you get it, then I'd encourage you to take, come back and look at these couple of slides I'm gonna go through now and actually take yourself out and do these couple of little tests so that you can start to have an awareness of what your walking quality is actually like. So a couple of really simple things that you can do for yourself. The first is looking at your walking pattern. Most of us these days have either a phone or a camera that can take video. Ask somebody to take a video of your feet in particular while you're walking, or at least a video where you can see your feet uh, from the side in particular, so that you can look for that heel strike and that push off the toe. And then maybe also from the front so that you can see whether or not your legs are underneath you, the way Hazel's were when she was in her four and a half year old video, or are they a little bit more spread out to the sides as it was in her younger video, which just is an indication of feeling a little bit less confident on your feet. So you want to analyze the movements of your foot and analyze the position of your leg after you have a chance to look, or as you have a chance to look at a video of yourself. The other thing that you can do is measure your walking speed. So you want to measure out an easy one is a 10 meter distance. It doesn't matter. You just have to change your uh, math equation. But if you can measure at a 10 meter distance, and then you're going to have somebody or you can time the amount of time it takes for you to walk the 10 meters at your normal walking speed. So this is not going as quickly as you possibly can for that 10 meters. You wanna to try to replicate what your normal walking speed would be. And then with a little bit of simple math, you can divide the number 10 by the number of seconds that it took you to walk that distance. And that will tell you what your walking speed is in meters per second. And so that number in and of itself isn't gonna be super valuable to you until you have this list or this table. So this table, you can take your number, find the line that matches with your age and sex, and then compare your meters per second speed with the meters per second speed that you see here. These are, uh, this is just an example of some normal walking speeds. So again, it's not your fastest walking speed possible, but just your self-selected if you were going for a walk, this is the speed with which you would walk. And you know, if you're above or below, it's not necessarily better or worse, but just an indication of where you fall compared to the average, right? 
This second screen is less to do with walking quality as it relates to using a walking program like we're really talking about tonight, but I thought it was important to include anyway because it, it does show the importance of walking speed as it relates to general health and risk for health concerns and issues with independence um, down the road. And so again, you can see along the bottom here, they've got the meters per second um, worked out for you. So you can follow along here to see where your number fits, just to make sure we would hope if you're out in a walking program that everybody would be at the 1.4 or beyond. But, um, but again, it's just important to recognize that walking speed is not only important for for the quality of a walking program, but also for our quality of life as we get older in particular. So there are six important factors, and we've touched on a couple of them already, that, let, that allow us to walk well or not. And so there are strength, power, flexibility, balance, as well as awareness and confidence. And we're just gonna take those apart a little bit now and look at what each of those might mean. So when we talk about muscle strength, power, flexibility, and balance, we're talking particularly in the lower body. So the strength and power is gonna be in our thigh muscles and our buttock muscles and our calf muscles, as well as in our trunk muscles. So the abdominals, the low back and the upper back as well to maintain good posture. Really important that those muscles are able to create the propulsion that we wanna use in order to have adequate speed when we're walking. The other thing that's important is flexibility. So flexibility, particularly in the calf or the lower leg is important to make sure that your foot and ankle has the right amount of mobility in order to be able to do that heel strike and push off the toe. And it's also important to make sure that your hips have enough flexibility because interestingly, if the hips are tight, we can't get a really good stride. And so one of two things is gonna happen. Either your walking speed is going to slow down and we've already talked about the importance of having adequate walking speed or you'll still continue to try to engage those muscles, but because the hip flexibility is lost, we end up putting more pressure through our lower back. And I treat a lot as a physio, I treat a lot of people who have a sore lower back, which is a problem for them when they're walking. And a lot of times it comes down to an issue with flexibility in their hips and the, what that's causing in the back. So we wanna make sure that we've got good flexibility in the calves to allow the foot and ankle to move and good flexibility in the hips to allow the hip to move properly and also to allow uh, the low back to function properly. Last one on our list here is balance. And again, you know, if we think back to that first video of Hazel when she was just learning to walk, when she does that, when you don't feel like you've got good balance, we tend to what we call widen your base of support. So you want to be have a, a, a bigger base to work from. So we put our legs further apart. We don't take big steps because that requires more security in a single leg stance position. Sometimes we, we forget about it when we're walking, but really walking is a series of one leg stands one right after the other. And so if your ability to stand on one leg isn't solid and secure, when you're walking, we can see that out of the ways that your, your body will start to make some compensations uh, in your walking pattern. So we need strength and power, we need flexibility, we need balance, these are all physical things that we need. The other things that we need though are an awareness. So I always like to say, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And so that's hard. <laughs> Uh, but hopefully by being here tonight and, and listening to me, you've got a little bit more awareness of walking quality and what it means to think about that and that you, you can just start paying attention to what your own step pattern is like and what your own speed is like and the things that are affecting it. And the other thing is trying to be aware of whether or not you're feeling confident when you're out walking. We know that apprehension or nervousness actually negatively impacts our walking quality. One of the easiest ways to think about that is if you remember what it's like it's coming not too far from now, uh, the icy ground. And so if you're in a parking lot and you look down and you see some ice, right away you have a little bit of apprehension. You don't, none of us want to fall. And so what do we do? Well, we put our hands out to the side. We put our legs out further. We take small steps and we look down right? Just like Hazel was doing in her 13 month uh, walking video there. And so all of those things though, have now negatively impacted our walking quality. That is completely appropriate if you're walking on an icy surface. Those are all the right things to do to try to limit the risk of a fall. However, if you're walking on a nice sunny day and there's no reason to think that there is a risk of fall is imminent, then we don't want to see those kinds of patterns or behaviors creeping into what, uh, what we're doing when we're walking. And so important to 
know that you're working on the strength balance and um, flexibility piece, have an awareness of how you're moving. And then if you've got all of those things working for you, that should help you be, to move more confidently. And if we move more confidently, we know we're reducing our risk of falls in particular. So what can you do to improve your walking? And we're gonna talk about this in three different uh, buckets. So we're gonna talk about it in the exercise bucket, in the tool bucket, uh, and what professional assessment can do for you. So let's start with exercises. Obviously as a physio, I've got a strong bias to exercise. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're working on muscular strength. So oftentimes for walkers, we'll do things like I'm showing here in the picture, going up and down on the, on the toes. That strengthens the muscles in the calf, which are the muscles that help push us forward when we're walking and give us speed when we're walking. We also need to work on the power of muscles. And so that's not just how strong a muscle is, but how quickly it can activate for us and, and move us. And so those kinds of exercises should also be incorporated into what you're doing to support your walking program. Flexibility is also important. So we need to be doing some stretches to work on those areas I talked about in particular in the lower leg and through the hip. Balance and agility exercises can be a fantastic addition into not only improve your balance and agility, but also increase your confidence in knowing that you've got the ability to react when something happens unexpectedly. Uh, and all of these kinds of exercises should be done two to three times a week. And that fits in line with those Canadian physical activity guidelines that we were talking about at the beginning. It is beyond the scope of our conversation today to go through and practice these with you, but that is what our October session is all about. So I really hope that you choose to join me and we'll talk more about it at the end here and on October 7th, when we'll actually go through and do a workout together, going through these kinds of exercises with you uh, and being able to answer your questions about them. So that's our exercise bucket for improving your walking. The next bucket is the tool bucket. So here, mindfulness is one of the first things I wanna talk about. And mindfulness is something that we talk about in, in lots of different avenues of life these days. But the fact that you're here and, and listening to me and hopefully soaking some of this in, I hope that can help you be a little more mindful when you go out walking next time and actually think about how your foot is hitting the ground and whether or not you're standing in an upright position and if you're moving along at a good clip or if you're I always say to some of my clients this should not be the Sunday saunter it should be actually moving along at a, at a moderate speed so just being mindful can be really helpful appropriate footwear is also important and this is not a one-size-fits-all thing it doesn't necessarily need to be a $300 shoe you don't necessarily need custom-made orthotics but it is important to make sure that you have the right footwear for you Almost always, we would suggest that people would be wearing a sneaker or a running shoe when they go out for their walking program. So something like a Birkenstock or a flip-flop or something, it's not going to be appropriate footwear. Um, but it is important to make sure that you've got the right thing for you. Braces, particularly for the knee and for the ankle, can be helpful because they can help either with feelings of instability or feelings of discomfort or pain. So if we feel like something is a little bit wobbly or unstable underneath us, or if we've got pain in our ankle or knee, naturally, those things cause us to walk a little bit differently and to move a little bit differently. And that can take away from the quality of our step pattern that we talked about earlier. The last thing are Nordic walking poles. So there's a familiar faces here. Hopefully you recognize at least Bill here and um, with the Nordic poles. And so Nordic walking poles are just a fabulous tool to increase the value of your walking program. Instead of your walk being primarily about your lower body muscles and heart and lung health, all of a sudden you get to bring in your postural muscles, you get to work your upper body, it increases the fitness component of your walking, and it can also add a little bit of stability and offloading for painful joints. So they really can be a fantastic tool to add into your uh, walking program. The last bucket uh, is the professional assessment piece. So again, of course, I've got a bias here, but I do think that it is important to, uh, when it comes to footwear, again, make sure that you've got the right thing for you. And so going to a reputable store where someone can actually assess your walking ability and match your foot to the shoe is really important. Uh, it's also important to make sure if you are using walking poles that you have them fit appropriately and that you're using the right kind of pole for you and that you know the right technique. So that's an important piece that, a, again, a professional can help you with. Uh, you can also have a walking or a gait pattern assessment with a, physio a physiotherapist or, and some other healthcare providers as well. 
And there, we talked about at the beginning that you could do uh, the video of yourself and, and time your walking speed. And those are great ways to do a little self-assessment and get a sense of where you are. But a professional is going to be able to have a closer look and really figure out where the barriers are for you in terms of optimizing your walking pattern and quality. Also, obviously, a professional will be able to have a look at your strength, have a look at your balance, and have a look at your mobility, and see how all of those things fit into the quality of your walking. And by an analyzing that, they can help develop a plan for you that's going to help tweak whatever your specific needs are in order to make sure you're getting everything out of each walk that you do. So hopefully you're feeling ready to start a walking program if you're not already out there. And these are some great general guidelines if you're thinking about getting started and you're not already out walking. I usually suggest to people that you start with 15 to 20 minutes at the beginning on a relatively flat terrain with even footing. So this doesn't mean that you can't have hills. It just means that you don't want to choose a route that's going up, down, up, down, up, down uh, throughout the whole thing. And you preferably don't want to be walking over tree roots and things like that as you get going to start. Uh, schedule wise, I always suggest at the beginning alternating walking days with non walking days. Uh, eventually, you can definitely progress that to walking every day if you want to. But at the beginning for your body, it's nice to give yourself about a 48 hour recovery from walking on one day uh, until you're, you're going out again. Doesn't mean you can't be active and do some other exercise or activity on that middle day, but perhaps just taking uh, one day off in between from your actual walking program. I always think tracking your progress in a journal is a great idea. It gives you a good sense of where your starting point was, gives you a place where you can just put in little notes about what went well, if something didn't feel quite right, if you had a question about something, then if you're working with a professional, they can help you troubleshoot what's going well and what needs to be tweaked. Um, and then again, just make sure that you do have the right tool. So the right footwear is just absolutely key. I can't say that enough. Um, and then also make sure that you've got any necessary aids available if you're going to use walking poles or brace or anything like that. If you're already walking and you want to progress your program, or if you just get started now and then soon you're ready to progress it, then um, it's important to recognize that you will need to progress it because our bodies adapt to the stresses that are placed upon them. And so they like changing stress. That's how we're going to get the most out of the program. So just make sure that you're always thinking about that and, and looking for ways to increase the challenge of your program. One of the best ways to do that is to increase the distance or the duration, but by no more than 10% per week. So what I mean by that is if you walk 20 minutes per walk last week, this week you want to do a little bit more, you could walk 22 minutes per walk this week. So it's not 10% every walk, but 10% each week. We find that as a general rule, if you do that, it allows the tissues enough time to adapt to those stress and you're less likely to have muscle strains or tendonitis and those sorts of things that you want to avoid. Remember the long-term goal with a walking program, if you're using it to hit your a uh, Canada activity guideline marker would be that you're trying to get to two and a half hours per week. Again, if it's your only uh, aerobic exercise. Uh, and if you do that, you're just going to be able to reap all those wonderful benefits of walking that we talked about at the beginning. So health prevention of, of a number of different diseases, reduce your risk of falls, reduce the risk of cognitive issues and dementia and, uh, and, and improve your mood, right? It really is a great activity for helping with mental health and wellness. So here we are just about at the end. I hope from today you've taken away, again, all of the physical and mental health benefits that can come from a walking program. You've got a little insight into some of the exercises and other tools that can help increase the value of your walking program by improving the quality of your walking. And I hope you're feeling ready to get started or to progress your program and, and that you recognize it doesn't have to be complicated, but sometimes a little help can be really helpful in terms of determining what the next best step is for you. This is one of my favorite quotes, which is, we don't stop exercising because we grow old. We grow old because we stop exercising. So our bodies are built for movement, right? We've got to find movements that they like to do, that we enjoy doing, uh, and then continue to do that. And by doing it, then this, uh, this machine of a body that we all have generally will function pretty well for us for a pretty long time. Well, that's great, uh, Laura. And I love that you... Uh... Uh, finished off with a quote from Ken Cooper, who is somebody that I 
worked uh, with and saw a lot of back uh, when I worked for the uh, YMCA uh, many, many uh, years <laughs> ago. And uh, his books on uh, fitness and uh, walking are still among the best that you can uh, that you can read. Uh, before we get to questions for, for Laura, and please put them in the uh, in the in the chat, I would like to share one other piece of uh, information uh, with you. Uh, can you see that, Laura? Okay. Can you see uh, my screen. I don't see yours. I'm still sharing. Do you want me to stop sharing for now? Uh, yes. Okay. You stop for a moment. Yeah. And has mine come up or do I have to reshare? You'll have to reshare, I think. Oh, there you go. There you go. All right. So, uh, Laura did mention uh, uh, Nordic uh, walking poles, and something that we wanted the CARP members to know is that uh, you can, uh, as a CARP member, get 10% off uh, a pair of uh, genuine Nordic walking poles and a free carry bag and free shipping anywhere in Canada so that uh, if you have friends or relatives you want to send them to in other parts of the country. So go to the CARP uh, website under the uh, benefits, you'll find the Nordic Walking Nova Scotia uh, site uh, there. And another benefit to uh, uh, Nova Scotia CARP members is the local CARP chapter uh, gets a percentage of the uh, of the, the profit on these uh, polls. So it all goes to a good cause. So just go to the carp.ca uh, website, the national uh, website and uh, uh, go to the, uh, uh, the benefits page, the lifestyle uh, section, or just search on Nordic walking polls and you'll find Nordic walking Nova Scotia there. And when you order them, uh, you'll be dealing with the other person in that picture you saw earlier, uh, my wife Esther, who is the uh, uh, is the operator of Nordic Walking uh, Nova Scotia. So let's go back to it, and I'm going to unshare my screen so that uh, uh, so that you could uh, share yours again, uh, Laura, if you need to. And uh, uh, I I had one one question in the uh, in in the chat. Uh, was asking about groups, uh, the groups and 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 classes. Uh, if if you sign up for the group at the BLT, do you have to go every week? Oh yeah, no. So uh, so it runs Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you can sign up to let us know that you're planning on coming. There's a couple little pieces of paperwork for Nova Scotia walks that you need to do, just so we have a little bit of information about you. Um, but then the the therapists that run those walks just communicate with people to find out who's coming on uh, on any given day. But uh, but yeah, no, you're not obligated to attend for sure. And you can choose to come to Tuesday or Thursday and you can change it on different days. We've got um, Maggie Sullivan and Shania Caravan who are part of our physiotherapy team here. Um, I think I can never keep track of who's doing it on which day, but Shania has one day and Maggie has the other. And uh, yeah, and they've got a, a great, a small but mighty group at the moment, but we're really happy to have other people join. And, uh, and it's 30 minutes in all levels. You can certainly bring walking poles if you've got some and, uh, and they're happy to just chat and you've got a, a physio year to um to listen to any questions that you've got for that half hour and then we also and um, so in working with carp and bill and esther we uh, have the traveler polls here and we've and we've got access to the other nordics polls as well uh, and we're really happy if you are if you'd like to buy a set of polls but you're not sure what the right set is for you and you think maybe a little bit of help in getting them set up and uh, and a short lesson on how to use them would be helpful then we're happy to offer that as a free service as part of a purchase of uh, of polls with us here so you can just call us at zoomers ahead of time and say i want to come in and get a set of polls can you set me up with the time and we'll set you up with one of our physios for 15 minutes to just make sure you've got the right thing and that you feel confident with them like i said i i absolutely love walking polls i suggest them all the time to clients on the flip side i have also treated some people who have had some injuries as a result of using walking poles so um, it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen on occasion. And so it's just important to make sure that you know how to use them. And that's where just a little bit of professional guidance can be helpful. And the other thing I should have pointed out, Laura, is that, and it is ideal to get your polls from someone who can set them up uh, for you. So, you know, you're starting off with them at the, uh, at the right height and you're using them properly. Laura and her staff can do that. And she will also honor the 10% yeah. off for CARP uh, members. So you don't have to do it through the uh, uh, website unless you want them mailed somewhere uh, 
or yeah. she have it put a pound, right? Yeah, and yeah then, we don't mail. <laughs> yeah, S -S Esther will do that. Another question is, if you go on the BLT walk, should you wear a mask? Strang said we do not have to wear them, but should really consider keep using them. People breathe heavier walking and there is a risk of exhaling. We have no idea who is vaccinated versus who is not. So uh, if you go on, on those walks, should you wear a mask? Yeah, so I would say it's not required, but it would be strongly recommended. And we would be trying to distance you sort of reasonably as well. Um, like I say, it's a pretty small group, so that's pretty easy to do at this point. But certainly you'd be welcome to wear a mask if, um, if you were most comfortable that way for sure. And we would recommend it. Good. Good. Well, any, so, are there any other uh, questions? I don't see anybody else putting any in the chat. Uh, can I? So, so I, yeah. yeah, I just want to say two other things. So we're going to talk on October 7th in this next session. We're going to have a chance to actually go through some of the exercises and do a bit of a class together, which is one of the things that we do here a lot at Zoomer. So we've got this program called Club Z, where we have some people come in for fitness classes, but also a lot of people who attend at home through Zoom, just like this. And uh, but, it, but it's set up in a way where the physio who's leading the class can also see you working out at home. So if you're interested in that, you think maybe a little bit of strength, balance, and mobility work could be helpful, it might be something that is worth checking out. And, and I'll talk more about that in October. But in the meantime, also, if you think I'm not sure what I need, <laughs> then uh, we also really love having people come in for what we call a fit for life assessment or a checkup. We often go to the dentist to get our teeth checked up. We have our eyes checked, but we don't very often have our strength, balance and mobility assessed unless there's an actual issue. And so um, one of the things we really recommend for people is come in, let us go through what you're doing with you, have a look at how your body's moving and then talk about any gaps that we find and help you make an action plan to be able to address them. And if you think that that is sort of of interest to you, then until the middle of October, we're really excited to offer CARP members 15% uh, off one of those assessments. So you can just go onto our website at zoomershealth.ca or you can call our front desk and, uh, and book an assessment. And you can just let us know when you book it or when you come in that you're with CARP and we'll apply that discount quite happily for you. And to follow up on, uh, on that, we will, this, this, uh, uh, webinar has been recorded. We will send all of you a copy of the recording or at least a link uh, to the recording that you're welcome to share with anyone who is interested. Uh, and uh, with that information, we'll send you some more uh, uh, written information about uh, these offers that Laura has just uh, given for you so that you can uh, follow, up, uh, follow up with her. And uh, we do have a couple of other questions that have come in, uh, Laura. So how Perfect. many steps on a Fitbit are required to meet the Canadian physical fitness standard? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop the share here and I will come into the gallery view. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I would say it, it's hard to say for sure because everybody's step is different, right? So generally speaking, uh, we would say, oh, my math, my math, my math, my math. I don't have these numbers off the tip of my tongue. Um, I mean, it, generally speaking, we say about 8,000 steps a day would be is a good target, right? right. Now, that's 8,000 steps a day. That's not necessarily 8,000 um, steps times seven, like 56,000 meets your two and a half hours because those steps are different, right? When we're talking about those 8,000 steps, it might just be walking to your laundry and then walking to the kitchen and then walk in. And remember I said, in order to count towards that two and a half hours, it needs to be in 10 minute bouts, right? So I think that we say that in 10 minutes, generally speaking, you take a thousand steps, right? So if we were to do that multiplication, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Nothing like being on the spot. <laughs> What's uh, 15,000? That would be 15,000, right? Yeah, yeah, look at that. Fast math. Whew. Yeah. Uh, so you can tell why I didn't go into physics. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 15,000. But remember, that wouldn't be 15,000 as counted by your Fitbit if you're wearing it all the time, right? Would be 15,000 if you're wearing your Fitbit and counting just the steps that you're doing for exercise walking as opposed to day-to-day -day walking. Right, and that's 15,000 steps per? Per week. 
per week. Yeah. So yeah. just be be clear. It's not 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 per day, but no, uh, no, but no, per no. week. Yeah. 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 So the recommended steps per day would be somewhere between eight and ten thousand. Again, assuming that you don't have a medical issue that makes that an unreasonable yeah. thing to attain. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think we would say don't get too hung up on uh, the number uh, the number of steps exactly in in that way. Uh, what what counts is that you're doing as much as you can each week. And remember that people take a different amount of steps. Uh, as you may have noticed in the picture of Esther and I, she is much shorter than me. And on every walk we to go go together, she walks 10 percent more steps than I do. Not that I'm competitive, but that can be really annoying. So don't get too hung up on the uh, uh, on the steps. And if you're if you're going the amount of time and walking at a reasonable rate and and doing it regularly, then uh, then you'll get the number of steps that you that you need. Yeah. Now, one final question here before we uh, go. We have a question. I have a clunk in my knee when I walk. Question mark. <laughs> Oh, the clicks and clunks and crackles. Yes. So, uh, I mean, of course, it would be beyond the scope of what we can do here today to talk specifically or give any specific medical advice. But uh, often we get uh, clunks or crackles in our knees. Uh, sometimes that can be a sign of a bit of osteoarthritis. Generally speaking, as a physio, I say if it's making noise, but it's not painful, we're not that worried about it. Great. Right. Uh, but the follow up to that would be if nobody has had a look at that clunk in your knee, there could easily be some things that you could do that would be helpful for the clunk. And so I'd recommend maybe connecting with a physio to just have an assessment and see whether or not oftentimes if you do some strengthening exercise and some stability stuff, you can get rid of the clunk. But but we're not terribly concerned about it as long as it's not painful. Generally, one 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 final question. Well, I will have time for this one. Asking one of our, because not every, all our members, of course, are in Halifax, is Halifax the, the only place I can go to get assessed? Uh, well, so Halifax is our only Zoomers location. And so if you want to come to Zoomers, then yes, Halifax is the only place. We can also do virtual assessments for anybody who's in Nova Scotia. If you're, uh, and that's actually been a great, one of the great things with COVID is that that's really brought this medium into more of the mainstream, right? And, uh, and even to just have an assessment to initially talk through things and see whether or not you might need to see somebody more local in your area. And then you could also sort of do that, start with an assessment with us online. And then uh, alternatively, reaching out to the physiotherapist in your area is another great option if, if we're not feasible for you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Laura. This has been wonderful. I know there's been great interest because uh, people have stayed uh, on the line all the way uh, through. <laughs> and I think it's great for us to uh, get through a session like this in under an hour. I think that makes it very comfortable uh, for people. And I look forward to October the 7th when we'll be doing the next, the follow up. Uh, session and I'm sure everybody who is uh, watching will tell their friends about it and uh, and come back and let us know how they